Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing, a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Pia Dorico and Daniel Coca. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Real Wealth, Real Health. Today, we're speaking to Jeff Finn, co-founder of the boutique hotel development firm, Artist Guild Hotels. Along with his partner and team, they specialize in bespoke hospitality experiences with an eye to craftsmanship, artistry, and design. Jeff has 15 years of experience in corporate finance and capital markets with a focus on real estate transactions for hospitality companies, commercial and residential real estate owners and developers, REITs, and home builders. Prior to Artist Guild Hotels, he was a managing director and co-head of the real estate and hospitality investment banking team at Imperial Capital. So obviously the focus of our conversation today with Jeff is on the hospitality sector of real estate. We talk about his current transaction in Hollywood, which is in an opportunity zone area, the charitable underpinning of every artist guild project and how they connected with Midnight Mission in Los Angeles. Jeff also gives us an honest and very candid viewpoint on hospitality assets, the impact of COVID, and the ongoing changes to corporate and personal travel as it's affecting major cities. We also speak about which areas within hospitality are already seeing major increases in business. Jeff walks us through the difference between boutique and flagged hotels and how hospitality assets compare to other commercial real estate asset classes, specifically multifamily. We learn what makes a hotel deal structure unique and how to assess its risk. There's so much to learn about the hospitality industry, hotels, hotel development, and opportunities in this episode. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we're uh, really looking forward to the conversation based on on our pre-call. And it's fun to see you right now because, you know, with this whole COVID, (laughs) we're doing this on Zoom, of course, and you've got all these surfboards hanging over your head and, uh, (laughs) you know, finding... Yeah, I I did get relegated to the garage. Um, It's 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 one of the one of the better places in the house to work actually yeah yeah and like me you're you're in southern california you're in manhattan beach and uh, so but you know dan and so that's how you got connected to us was through dan and you're on our podcast today because you have this incredible background in real estate and specifically we'll be talking about hospitality as an asset class and what we're also really excited to talk to you about is the company that you formed with your partner Danny and what it's all about. So before we jump into hospitality, which, you know, of course, at this moment in time in end of May of 2020, looks like zombie land due to, to COVID. As as all really good real estate entrepreneurs know, there's always opportunities. So I'm really I'm really excited to dive into all of that. But to begin with, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your company, Artist Guild? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks for having me. So my background is, is mostly finance, and I spent about what 15 or 16 years in investment banking prior to starting Artist Guild with Danny. And the vast majority of that time was real estate focused. And a lot of what I did was distress or special special situations focused. And that's actually how I got to know Daniel back when he was an attorney. And you know, a, a lot of our niche was doing sort of corporate level financings or financings or advising on mergers and acquisitions that, you know, trended over into hospitality quite a bit. And that's eventually how I met my partner, Danny. And we started looking at transactions together. You know, he has a really deep background in boutique hospitality development and redevelopment. 
and has done 20 plus sheep hotels, primarily in Southern California and primarily kind of hybrid entry markets of Southern California. And his real niche and his former company's real niche um, still is sort of finding underutilized assets and re-envisioning them, you know, in a way that you know, maximizes the cash flow that you can generate from that product. And very, very good at doing it. I think what made them unique was not only sort of bringing a boutique and artistic touch to what they did and what you know we now do also, but also doing it in a way where we have a really distinct focus on controlling cost and making sure that, you know, we do something that is impactful, but, you know, is also something that, you know, from a cost basis standpoint, that makes sense for our investors. And, you know, a lot of what my background brought to the table was also looking at that and saying, can we be more impactful from a situational perspective? Can we find assets and acquire assets where we're not, you know, competing at the highest per key cost basis? Can we find unique transaction structures? Can we find, and this was hard up until a couple months ago, find assets that so maybe there's a capital structure issue or there's some distress that's involved. And Danny and I started looking at things together. You know, the one thing that I think kind of we both were really interested in when we first started talking about forming artist guild and, you know, aside from kind of creating a platform of boutique hotels and sort of leveraging a lot of Danny's hospitality redevelopment expertise was doing something that had some type of double impact to it. And, you know, we both live and have lived in Los Angeles for a very long time and Southern California for a very long time. And in particular, when we started looking at, you know, what's our project in Hollywood, you know, it was a long time ago. It was, we started looking at that project sort of middle of 2017, I think. And Hollywood, you know, and downtown LA, but all over LA are an area where you see a tremendous amount of homelessness. And as we started looking at our building, you know, our kind of thought started to shift to, you know, can we do a great project for our investors um, can cr- we create an asset here that's interesting and iconic, but can we do something that also impacts the community more broadly? And for us, the sort of real obvious way to do that was to do something where there was a tie into homelessness. And we kind of, after brainstorming on it for a really long time, sort of thought there was kind of something poetic about the hospitality industry as a hotel, you know, partnering up with, you know, the homeless services organizations that are in any city, but in Los Angeles in particular for us, because you do have, you know, fundamentally, when you think about hospitality and hotels, you have a visitor coming to a city for a night or several nights when a resident of that city, you know, may be homeless. And sort of this concept of, you know, a traveler being sheltered here, you know, we thought could translate to, well, are there opportunities to create shelter for someone in this city who is a resident who doesn't have it? And we sort of, you know, over time started reaching out to a couple of home, different homeless services organizations in the LA area, had a lot of really good conversations with a group called Midnight Mission that, you know, big plug for Midnight Mission. They, they do really great things in the city of LA and have been continuously operating their homeless shelter down in Skid Row in downtown, I think since 1907. Um, something for really impressive. It's been well over sort of a hundred years that they've been operating that thing 24 seven. And so we felt like they were a really natural partner for us and, you know, came up with this idea of doing what we're calling sort of a night for a night where for any individual that stays at our hotel, um, so we have a guest there, we donate proceeds to house a person at the Midnight Mission for a night in downtown LA. And that sort of initial concept is something we're trying to tie throughout the rest of the projects we're doing as Artists Guild is, you know, something that you know, was really important um, because it's, you know, it's fun to go to work and work on real estate projects, but it kind of gives you this a little bit broader sense of purpose when you're doing something like that. And I think it's been a huge motivator for us um, to kind of, you know, when you're having tough days on a project and you have setbacks or whatever it is, to kind of feel like you have a little bit broader of a purpose, it motivated us to, um, in addition, hopefully it's something that, you know, ha- has an impact in the city. And we're actually hoping that other hotel or hospitality operators, you know, do more of it, you know, and kind of steal the idea um, we, we'd love to see sort of it become sort of a de facto standard, you know, in Los Angeles or in hospitality broadly where someone would say, look, you know, we're going to partner with, it could be any, you know, any sort of charitable cause. But I, I think there's something for us that sort of rang true about homelessness that, that made us focus on that. Yeah, for, first off, and we've talked about this before, you know, huge congrats on on making the move. Hopefully you'll have the opportunity to 
you know, buy that piece of your soul back you gave up as an investment banker for, I'm, I'm working <laughs> on it my, myself as well. But it, it's an awesome story. And one of the things we want to chat about first is this whole opportunity zone investing and what that means. It's It's been in the media for, for years and you and I talked about this separately. There's a, a media cycle in real estate and opportunity zones really got hyped up for a while. They definitely provide some interesting, you know, tax incentives for certain types of investors. Your project, interesting to me, was located two blocks from where I lived in a brand new class A building in Hollywood. So not exactly <laughs> that true opportunity zone as uh, people might think about it. But, you know, Hollywood is a is an area that's, you know, undergoing a, a lot of change, a lot of development and and whatnot. And so just as a first step, would love to hear your perspective on opportunity zone deals, why they make sense, who they make sense for, why you guys thought this project fit into that category, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. it we, we did, you know, I, I would say our involvement in opportunity zones was unintentional. When we, I think I mentioned, uh, when we first started looking at this asset, when it was first for sale, um, this was the, uh, I think, summer of 2017. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act wasn't actually passed, I think, until late December of 2017. So our sort of interest in this asset kind of predated the, you know, the actual formation of the legislation that led to the Opportunity Zone program. And, and I think that kind of is, that fact can kind of fundamentally describe sort of, you know, how we think about Opportunity Zones, which is if you have a great project and something you really like and think fundamentally is makes sense and is a good location, great project, great team around it. It's nice to have the opportunity zone benefits, but I would always generally think about it as kind of a nice to have. And it, you know, in our mind, it doesn't make a reasonably good deal a very good deal. It doesn't really make um, even a good deal a very good deal. It, it's kind of something that's sort of just a, a little bit of a, a cherry on top of, you know, what should be hopefully you know, a, a really good cake. And I, I think that's kind of how we look at it. It wasn't a motivating factor at all to us getting involved in this particular project. And then just generally speaking, I don't know if it's helpful just kind of quickly summarize, you know, what the Opportunity Zone program is or isn't. But yeah, the, you know, generally speaking, it, it's a tax deferral program. And the idea is that an investor with capital gains of any type, they could be short term, long term, they could be from any type of asset, they don't at all have to be a real estate generated capital gains transaction. It could be from the sale of stock. It could be from you know, a piece of artwork or car. You can defer that capital gain until December 31st of 2026, I believe, and reduce that gain by up to 15%. And then any new gain from the new investment is cap gains tax-free when that capital gain event is triggered in the future. So it does provide someone who happens to be sitting on a capital gain. Maybe you're sitting on, you know, large gains in equity. And you say, look, you know, the market's rebounded tremendously from sort of the COVID lows. I want to take some dollars off the table here, but I don't necessarily want to have to pay cap gains tax, particularly if it's short-term cap gains. If you find a really good project that you otherwise wouldn't invest in and think it's a, it's a great project, you know, at that point in time, I think it's, you know, it's worth thinking about other things being equal. An opportunity zone project is beneficial for an investor in that context. The one thing I would caveat though is, you know, there's a there's a loss of liquidity when you're doing that, right? You do this that project will be held for 10 years. And for some people, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But generally I think if you're going to be acquiring real estate, you shouldn't be thinking about a whole period of less than 10 years in most situations anyway. So that's sort of our thoughts on it, how we got involved. It was really mostly an accident, quite honestly. And then I think another important component of opportunity zone deals is the redevelopment component. You know, you're yeah. not investing in, uh, you know, your typical kind of value you add, we're going to spend 10K a unit doing renovations. This needs to be a, a heavy lift. And in your case, the project you're working on is perfectly suited for that. But we could just chat a little bit more about exactly what you guys are doing. Yeah, so we have a uh, what's about a 1920s vintage office building on Hollywood Boulevard, just a few blocks west of the W at Hollywood and Vine. 
And we're taking that 1920s office building and converting it into an 85 key boutique hotel. And you know, the general premise is, is to renovate that project. We're actually adding a few stories to the project. So it is a significant renovation. We're keeping all of the historic exterior of that building. Um, it's it's a, you know, what we think is a visually interesting building that is a contributor to a historic district in Hollywood. Um, so we're really excited about doing something that you know, not only is an opportunity zone program, but you know, in our mind kind of contributes to some of the historic fabric of Hollywood, the neighborhood we're in. And the idea is to create a product there that you know, is maybe a little bit upmarket from kind of what exists there today sort of a higher end luxury boutique asset there that'll have some, you know, hopefully some great F and B outlets and some things like that that makes sense given the location in Hollywood. Is the project near any of the new the new public transit that was coming in as well? It's it's located right next to the Hollywood by Metro Station. That metro station has been there uh, for quite a while but is a is an important metro station in LA. I think it's one of the highest traffic metro stops that's there. And that's that that metro station sort of just below sort of the W complex there. We're a block and a half west of that. So for location from a public transit standpoint, and we're also sort of happen to be sort of on the walk of fame there in Hollywood to get a lot of you know, pre COVID, got a lot of pedestrian traffic through that portion of Hollywood. And you know, our building happens to be sort of in a view area where, you know, you do have tremendously interesting views of the Hollywood sign, uh, particularly as we're adding some stories to that building. We think it'll have some very special new corridors and some opportunities for, you know, it, it, we are in Southern California for, you know, outdoor experiences that are pretty unique relative to, you know, what someone traditionally gets in sort of a normal hotel room. Yeah. And just out, out of curiosity, how did you go about finding the building like outside of it being an opportunity zone because like you said it became an opportunity zone or it, it got yeah zoned that way afterwards but how how does like how do you go about finding a property and putting putting that deal together you know it, it's, a, it's a good question I, I would say this is a really kind of case study sort of our typical acquisition you know it's something that generally takes a for us usually takes a really long time and is usually something that has, it's either something that was, you know, came about because there was some situational distress, whether or not it was just a great asset with a bad capital structure, whether or not maybe there was a lawsuit surrounding it. And this is a lot of what we look at and a lot of what we, you know, particularly today, and it was the case with this asset in Hollywood, it's sort of what I would describe as a busted sales process. And we see a lot of those where someone goes to market with something um, with some sort of price or some sort of structure in mind, and it's just off market. And that was really, really typical, particularly in that time frame, kind of going into 2016, 2017. Um, and you know, still sort of pre-COVID was the case 2018 and 2019 as well, where you just had sellers whose views with respect to market values, you know, were not in tune with what buyers were willing to pay. And that was sort of the case with this asset. It got listed for sale and was up for sale for quite a long time, didn't ever transact. We put in a couple bids to purchase the fee that were you know, significantly, significantly less than what the asking price was and didn't get any traction there. And the asset sort of continued to sit. And then the owner there, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, ended up having some issues at the asset and had started to have some tenants leave largely because he just wasn't maintaining the asset. I think when he decided, hey, I'm going to put this up for sale, the idea was, I'll put this up for sale. I can kind of take my foot off the gas. And it just didn't sell quickly. And it led to some erosion of the tenant base that was there at the existing office building. It left him with a lot of vacancy. That vacancy sort of, oddly enough, transitioned into there being some squatters at the asset. And the asset sort of evolved in the situation where there were just some problems around it. And we ultimately decided to go with him and offer it, offer to ground lease the building instead of actually purchase the fee. And so we sort of went to what became sort of a, a transaction with a little bit more hair on it over time and brought, you know, what was sort of a different transaction structure than I think what the owner was ideally looking for, but something that ultimately enabled us to take control of the asset. So now we, we don't own the fee to the building. We actually have a 99 year ground lease on the asset that you know allows us to redevelop it and hold it for quite a long time it functionally should you know from our standpoint and our investor standpoint you know really be sort of the equivalent to fee ownership in the asset but was really the only way we could transact 
at an economic level that you know made rational sense in terms of generating good returns for our investors. And then there was, as we were doing that, sort of this deterioration in the building itself that, you know, from our standpoint as, as a potential buyer was pretty useful. And, you know, we've looked at a lot of assets that are like that, where there's just something that sits for a while, uh, where an owner has an idea about value and you can come to him and be creative and outside the box and say, look, maybe we joint venture on the asset. Maybe we'll ground lease the asset from you. And then we look at stuff that is more outright distress, right? And some of that's not only market driven, some of that's capital structure driven. You know, someone who happens to be in default and, you know, we've seen assets, you know, we're working on an asset right now here in Southern California that's in receivership um, because an owner refused to comply with some orders to make some fire code changes from the city. And it got so bad, the asset ended up in receivership. So we kind of look for situations like that. I think one of the things that's really made us a little bit different and particularly in kind of the boutique world is we don't necessarily say, look, we're going to, we're creating this boutique brand and every asset that we're going to work on needs to fit in this box that we've created. And, you know, that's sort of been a strategy a lot of people have followed. Some people very successfully, we say, look, this is what a artist guild asset is. And they're all going to have the same name. They're all going to fit this formula. And we're going to do our first one here in New York. And then maybe we'll do a second one in New York. Then we'll go to LA. Then we'll go to Portland. Then we'll go to Austin. And you know, then we'll go to Nashville for Daniel. And that that has worked really well for a lot of people. I, you know, I think for us, you know, where that hasn't worked so much, you tend to sort of force yourself into finding a transaction and needing a transaction that is exactly a certain way. And the best opportunities we see tend to be more organic, where you have to adapt to the transaction. I think that's something fundamentally that Danny and I sort of have always agreed upon is to not let sort of our desire to create something exact and make every asset um, rhyme with the next one overrule our desire to find really good transactions. I think when I hear you say that, and I'm thinking about, obviously you're in the boutique hotel industry as opposed to, I don't know if you call it branded or is it flagged, the the sort of larger brands, is, is that the right word? Yeah, I think flagged's a good way to put it. Okay, that it, it seems contrary to try to take a boutique brand and force that brand into an asset, at least, at least for me, and maybe I have more of an artistic bent, but I think that especially if you're working with assets like the one in Hollywood, that is in a historic location, that preserving some authenticity in that building serves you and provides actually a much better experience for your guests. So I like, I like your approach that you're, that you're not trying to force your idea onto an, an asset. Yeah. We, we felt like that, that was really important as we were, you know, trying to kind of create the fabric of what is artist guild and try to be, you know, flexible and creative, not just in terms of what we bring and create at the asset level, but also in terms of how we approach actually acquiring an asset and, you know, try to bring, you know, a certain amount of kind of artistry to the actual deal structure itself and to how we think about things. And I think fundamental to that was just being creative and trying to be opportunistic. And like you mentioned, not really kind of forcing a certain agenda onto a certain type of asset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would love to continue talking about all things design and, and brand. I love, I love that kind of stuff. But what I would, I actually think it'd be a really great time now to transition into hospitality um, as an asset class, because yeah. obviously we're in this, it feels like a zero point. There was the, that really in hospitality there was before and there's going to be after as it relates to the pandemic. Whereas, you know, as Alpha, we, we invest in a lot of multifamily and there's not this big distinct before and after. Right. But it certainly seems to be that way in, in the hotel asset class. So can you talk a little bit about the hospitality asset class and the impact that COVID has had on it, at least thus far? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been obviously a tremendously negative impact hospitality and hotels broadly. I mean, you if you look sort of across the market, you know, I'm just talking U.S. generally, 
you know, you had rev par levels that decreased by, you know, 80% going into, you know, a lot of April and the earlier weeks of this month. And that started to stabilize somewhat. I mean, I think the last sort of statistics I saw is on average across the U.S. sort of for like the first, I think the second week of this month, second week of May, you know, on average assets were running in kind of the low 30s from an occupancy level. And, you know, that's better than it was sort of the last two weeks of April. So you're actually seeing sort of a trend of less bad data happening, which which is good. And I think as you've sort of seen over the last week in particular, more reopenings kind of getting into the early part of summer, I think some assets will actually start to see a rebound. And I think what happens from here is going to be very directly tied to whether or not you sort of see a second wave of the virus. I think that will not only stop people from traveling, I think that will make the recovery from that point forward when that second wave ends much slower. Because I think having a kind of go through the virus twice will be much more damaging to sort of long-term confidence than going through it once and people sort of be able to look at say, that's something that's behind us now. That's something that's not necessarily going to kind of keep spiking up. And I think that confidence will be really crucial to sort of a full scale recovery in the sector. Um, but just generally, I mean, the, the impact of the, you know, from a hotel perspective was you know, pretty catastrophic. It's you know, one of the probably worst events, you know, as a hotel owner operator that you could probably imagine happening. And granted, it, it will be hopefully relatively short in duration. And the recovery out of it, I don't think will be sort of V-shaped, but I do think there'll be, and for, there'll be winners and losers, but I, I think for some assets in particular, I think that there will be a reasonably rapid, you know, path back to at least operating profitably. But I think there is that sort of recover, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see, but I think you kind of have seen it to some extent, some precursors to that, at least that we've been hearing anecdotally. I, th- I think any place that's a, a fly to market um, that's really dependent upon really regular airlift, like something like Hawaii, you know, you've seen those markets be the most impacted out of most major markets. I think probably Oahu is probably the most impacted kind of maybe top 30 market you've seen in the U.S. from a hospitality standpoint. And, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, that you will see a longer path to recovery there. I think there have been drive to markets, you know, we focus mostly on the West Coast. Most of my examples would be sort of West Coast based and California based, but drive to markets, particularly with beach access here, you know, from people we know who are owners in markets like that and operators in markets like that. So actually weekend traffic the last two or three weeks has been much better than you would have expected when you're kind of looking at national occupancy levels in like the thirties. So I think this theme of, Outdoors, be it a beach location or sort of a mountain location, is going to play really well. I think the theme of drive to locations where you're in close proximity to, you know, any major city, uh, I think will be really helpful. And we've seen sort of the luxury segment sort of, it seems like potentially be leading out. I, I think you have a lot of people that, you know, maybe are reasonably well off who have vacation planned early in the summer or through you know, kind of spring that have deferred those plans and are now saying, look, you know, we're going to do something in the next two or three weeks that's you know sort of large and extravagant. And there's also the concept of a lot of luxury assets tend to be assets by nature that you know have more detached hospitality units, have larger units and feel less crowded. And I think that's going to be really important to people when they look at and say, you know, would I rather go stay at, you know, the Four Seasons in Manhattan or would I rather go stay at Amangiri in the outskirts of Utah? And I think you'll see those sort of isolated retreat-based places that, you know, kind of offer an exit from an urban scenario play really well and um, recover sort of faster than some other assets will. Well, you've definitely revealed how bougie you are with the Amangiri three grand a night reference. <laughs> real, real casual. <laughs> but it looks like an awesome spot. I hope to get out there at some point. I have a buddy who just sold the company and is like, that's where I'm going for a week. And so it seems like a cool spot. Nevertheless, you know, what I wanted to chat about is, you know, as an acquisitions guy, as a as an investment banker, as someone who pays attention to how to finance a deal. 
how do you coming into a new project in this environment decide what an asset is worth you know and are you seeing a bigger gap between buyer and seller valuations like what is the marketplace for acquisitions in the hospitality asset class look like today honestly i think it's almost non-existent over the last several weeks and months I don't think that there's really a fluid market in hospitality at the moment at all. I, I think there are people who were considering selling assets pre-COVID that are going ahead with those asset sales now. And I think those processes are you know, being elongated and there's a lot of price discovery going on there. I, I don't think it's an easy question to answer broadly You know, where our value and valuations are obviously going to go down, but how far... I think it really is going to be incredibly situational because of things we sort of just discussed a little bit. I think if you're if you're talking about a a high end luxury asset that can prove that they weather the COVID storm better than others, to some extent, you know, you may see premiums for assets like that when they do transact. And I think most owners are at least right now are thinking or hoping that the impacts will just be temporary. And if they don't have to sell today, they really aren't. And, you know, you're going to have some for sellers that for capital structure reasons are going to, you know, end up giving back assets to lenders. You're going to see some of that, hopefully not a tremendous amount, but you're going to see some of that. But I don't think, I haven't seen that really play out yet. I think you're still early enough into the impacts that you know, most lenders are, most assets that are having really acute issues and had high leverage on them are in forbearance periods with lenders right now. And I think you're gonna to continue to see sort of the can get kicked down the road and lenders try to really be constructive um, as much as they can. I don't think anybody wants to step into the shoes of an owner of an asset that was really impacted heavily by COVID. You know, where we have sort of seen some opportunity and it honestly was, was quite short lived you know, was in acquisitions, CMBS debt, you know, sort of, you know, I guess that was probably the earliest parts, you know, maybe middle of March and maybe towards the end of March, you really had some forced selling that you saw there. And for anyone that was quick enough to, you know, acquire liquid positions there, I think that was, you know, a really interesting place to deploy capital for a pretty short time. But you, you haven't seen that sort of transition yet that, Distress that you kind of saw momentarily in a liquid market hasn't really transact hasn't really translated to the private market in terms of transactions. And I think most of the lag you're probably seeing there is sellers who are thinking about selling who are saying, "Well, we're just not going to sell now." And then assets that are in distressed situations, you know, going through a period of forbearance and you know, work out with lenders. And I think it will. You'll have to. It'll probably take another three to six months sort of before some of those things actually become transactional more opportunities. So as someone who is a real estate investor as well, you know, expanding outside of, of hospitality, where's the opportunity in this COVID environment, you know, as it relates to real estate or, or you know, other alternatives? Like, what do you think is interesting these days? You know, I think that there's going that corporate debt, putting aside real estate perspective, but just thinking on a macro perspective, there's going to be some really interesting opportunities. I think you're going to see a, you know, you have seen uh, a rebound in that market, but I think you're going to see sort of a softening. I think you're going to have some really interesting opportunities to deploy capital into into corporate capital structures, into operating businesses, you know, that are in distress. I think you're going to see a fair amount of that happen. You know, in real estate specifically, I do think that the best opportunities will be in hospitality. I, I think that, you know, it, it's an unfortunate situation and it's going to lead to some turnover and ownership on a lot of assets and some opportunities to create a unique basis in assets that, that you may, you know, otherwise not have an opportunity to. And I think, you know, maybe kind of talking, to, because, I, because I mentioned it earlier, something like Hawaii, right? I mean, it's very, very, very difficult to get asset zoned and approved really anywhere in the islands, particularly when you're talking about something that's close to the water. And there's a, it's an extraordinarily high barrier to entry market. When you look at today, the 
you know, where some of the distress in terms of operating performance has been the worst, it probably, you know, it is in Hawaii or markets like that. I think those opportunities will, you'll see some really smart investors make some acquisitions of assets like that, that, you know, 10 years, 15 years from now, you know, look extraordinarily smart in hindsight. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you'll really see that sort of translate um, so much to multifamily. You know, it's, I, I think multifamily, you know, from what I've seen, generally speaking, um, and I'm sure case by case is very different, but it, I think rent collections really haven't been kind of impacted yet in a way that I think a lot of people thought they would or would otherwise be if you sort of gave someone sort of like a headline 20% unemployment number and said, you know, what do you think vacancies are going to do if you have 20% unemployment? Right. And I think a lot of that is because hopefully, you know, we don't have sustained 20% unemployment, right? And hopefully we rebound rapidly to where we were and, you know, all the PPP loans and other things and other stimulus measures that the government put in place really do act as a band-aid to, you know, allow people to, you know, continue to pay rent and maybe landlords have to take a couple of haircuts for a couple of months, but it doesn't actually end up being sort of a long-term situation that causes any you know, significant impact from an investor's perspective to multifamily. Yeah. You know, Adapi, you asked, you asked something a little bit earlier that that's kind of an interesting thing that, you know, we can touch on a little bit, which is sort of hospitality outside of COVID as an asset class, you know, yeah. relative to other real estate asset classes is, is kind of a unique one. And, you know, maybe, maybe we're spending a little bit of time on, because it's something that kind of tends to be treated kind of like a, you know, a bit of a kind of bastardized form of real estate, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, definitely. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's an area obviously we like a lot. And I think, you know, the general perception, I think, from a lot of real estate investors perspective and, and maybe maybe your, your collective perspective is, you know, hospitality is an area to avoid as a real estate asset class and generally the justification you would you would hear from most people is that hey it's it's too close to an operating business right it's it there's operating components to that that make it more complex and there's inherent volatility because of the short term nature of you know what what you would think of as leases but short term nature of stays at hotels right and so it's not the same as multifamily where you have year-long leases or retail where you can have five-year leases or office where you can have 10-year leases and, you know, cash, there are longer contractual cash flow streams that are associated with the asset. I mean, that's sort of generally what everyone, you know, the kind of the consensus, like I think most people look at it. You know, I think our view on that is, you know, that those things are true. There is an operating risk component to any hospitality business. And there's a lot of volatility, uh, can be a lot of volatility, because you're dealing with something that you're essentially leasing for a night, right? And you're saying you stay here for a night, and then maybe we have to change the rate tomorrow. Maybe you don't show up at all tomorrow. For us, you know, I, I think that kind of creates a lot of the opportunity. And I don't think we fundamentally view risk as sort of being synonymous with volatility. I think that's kind of the one thing that, from our perspective, is a little bit different about hospitality and hotels that, you know, a lot of people kind of tend to write off when they say, look, it's not a great place to invest because there's volatility. It's the first asset that reacts in an economic downturn and you don't have, you know, any credit support around leases. You don't have duration of leases, things like that. You know, I think the way we look at it is that risk isn't necessarily the same thing as volatility. And while you may have volatility in cash flows to us, risk is, you know, the way we conceptualize risk is more of the probability of kind of having a permanent loss. And when you think about holding an asset for a longer period of time and avoiding loss, things to us, things like maybe you have a seasonal asset where in the summertime you can, you know, have, be running 85 or 90% occupied. And in the spring or fall, shoulder seasons, you can be running 20% occupied. So an asset where there's an inherent, a tremendous amount of volatility in it. To us, that doesn't necessarily mean the asset is more risky to an investor, right? Because the way we look at risk is that well, what's the probability that you actually lose money? And when we think about risk and thinking about other asset classes, you know, and you guys obviously do a tremendous amount of multifamily and just picking on multifamily a little bit, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, generally real estate assets fail in, in our experience really isn't because they're 
is an operational issue at the asset as much as there's a capital structure issue. And an asset is over leveraged. And probably 90% of what I've seen in terms of failure in real estate and actual what I perceive as risk, which is loss of capital, comes from an asset being over levered, not from there being operational volatility in the cash flow stream. And so when when we think about that, you know, multifamily comparing its hospitality is an asset class that's, you know, because it's lower yielding generally, you traditionally see people be much more aggressive with leverage. And, you know, I, I think when you look at sort of creating a all-in, you know, equivalent levered return using generally what's less leverage on a hospitality asset and more at leverage on a, on a multifamily asset to kind of achieve the same levered return, I think a lot of times you're actually taking more risk in a multifamily scenario, even though you may have an asset that is inherently less volatile. But I don't know that you're significantly reducing the probability that you have kind of an, a capital impairment, a loss of the asset. So that's kind of how we kind of think about it. Um, and one of the reasons we like hospitality is because there is this volatility, but you know, if you manage around that prudently, there's higher yields that are associated with it that allow you to generate returns without necessarily using the same amount of leverage. And it's an asset that because of that volatility, there are great opportunities to enter and exit assets that in something like multifamily, you know, you may not have because it's, you know, it's an asset that category that, you know, can be incredibly crowded, incredibly competitive. And because, you know, residences and homes in general are, you know, a little bit more of a commodity product and not always, right. But just generally speaking, it's a, you know, there's a utilitarian part to, you know, having a home and having shelter, you know, it's, it's something that is a little bit more of a commodity driven market sometimes in our view. And obviously that's not always the case. And there are multifamily developers, and multifamily operators that are very, very, very good at what they do um, and have tremendous track record in multifamily. For, for us, hospitality is a space that is a little bit less crowded and sometimes creates more opportunity. And I think for us, you know, in certain situations, better risk-adjusted return. I had never considered it that way. Maybe because I've never invested in hotels and, and I know that that we don't, but that's really interesting when you're talking about it being more risk around the capital structure and you know there's going to be some opportunities for purchasing at markdowns soon so it kind of sounds like there's going to be opportunities to buy assets so that's one thing and then i'm thinking about all of the changes that are happening to our behavior as consumers and as a society and the latest one, because I never even considered how things worked. I feel like this whole pandemic just blew so much stuff in our faces, everything from like how supply chain works to, you know, the hospitality industry. Like I was just reading the other day that um, the fashion industry is basically calling off fashion week. Um, the creative director at Gucci basically said like, we're, we're not doing fashion week anymore. A, because it, you know, they're kind of taking it as an opportunity because it was draining their creativity anyway, doing these five shows a year. It's like a traveling circus for three months out of the year for them. But what's interesting to me about this is the amount of money that the fashion weeks bring to those cities. And I'm thinking that like, it's like 600 million for New York. It's like more than Super Bowl. It, it's the amount of money that fashion week brings and lack of you know people pulling back on conferences and doing a lot of summits online and so where i'm trying to go with this is hotels and if people aren't traveling for all these these you know bigger events is it's going to impact hotels and we still obviously don't know how it's all going to play out and then you have maybe boutique hotels that are going to be able to do better luxury hotels because they can they have a it's almost like you feel like you're more socially distant than in something that is a little a little denser as 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 it goes but i just think you know there's the asset opportunity and then there's going to be what are you going to do with it with all of these changes that are happening i think it presents uh this like this like both both things happening at the same time to to try to come up with what are you going to do with the asset if you buy it you know beyond the capital structure but from a cash flow perspective 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really great question. There, without question, will be significant, have been significantly larger impacts to larger convention style or group travel dependent assets. I, I think those are going to be, you know, we kind of talked about locations in terms of product size and hospitality. Major is definitely going to be worse, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. And I think anything that is business travel and group travel and convention focused and large event focused is really going to have a, a really hard recovery. And then the question becomes, do those assets recover? And if not, if you, you know, had a 500 room convention hotel that, you know, four years from now, you know, you're still operating this thing at 40% because it's so large and people four years from now are still, some, look, we'll do some group events, but they're going to be smaller events. And, you know, we're going to, you know, run them over a larger number of days and have less participants and things like that and more for interaction virtually. I think it's going to impact conventional assets significantly. And then, you know, you're kind of seeing this in retail too. The question becomes, well, if those assets just structurally end up being broken, is there a better and higher use for them? And I'm just like people are looking at, you know, indoor malls today and saying, you know, can these things be demolished to create housing? Can they be reinvented, you know, as, you know, entertainment type assets? You know, can they be invent reinvented as logistics facilities? I think you're going to see probably not to the same extent you're seeing that um, happen in retail, but I think you're going to see some situations where people look at larger hospitality assets and, you know, and think creatively and say, look, this thing for the last, you know, five years post COVID really hasn't, has only been able to recover to, you know, half its COVID peak. Is it better if I go in here, acquire this on some multiple of trailing cash flow and, reinvent it as, you know, as multifamily and create, you know, a multifamily asset at a hotel. And I think you may see some conversions like that longer term, you know, particularly in areas like California, where you have, you know, need for housing. I think those things would be looked at really positively, you know, from, you know, most of a kind of city planning standpoint and from a general public perception standpoint, you know, particularly if that use ends up being affordable housing, which to some extent, you know, hotel assets largely are better suited to do, you know, to create into, you know, affordable style housing than they are sort of traditional style housing, just because the room sizes are, you know, traditionally so much smaller. And so, you know, I, I think you will see that. I think there will be, and I don't think it's going to be a huge portion, but I think there is some part of the hotel supply that exists today that you know five years from now will be and or should be sort of reinvented potentially as you know as multifamily or as for sale housing and i, I think particularly in areas where housing itself is incredibly unaffordable and supply for traditional housing is really constrained i think you may have you know some transition of that yeah i'm, I'm really glad you went there with that because i was really curious what what your thoughts were on the redevelopment of it, especially given it's different because you're going from an office to a boutique hotel with your opportunity zone in Hollywood. Yeah. But, you know, it, there's like, to me, and we've talked about this on other episodes with other guests too, is, is that real estate is fundamentally a creative industry. People get really creative and solutions oriented. And I, for one, I'm actually really excited to see how we come out of this in a few years, like what gets restructured, like literally to serve some needs that like you're saying here in Southern California, we have a housing shortage. We still will for a really long time. <laughs> so, you know, it's the work that developers do like you to take an asset like you're doing with that, that office and, and making it into a hotel boutique hotel in Hollywood and maintaining it. And it's great work that you're doing and all of your insights today were really wonderful. I've got a total education on, on hotel and, and hospitality and um, really looking forward to, A, I'm going to go drive and see your building. <laughs> <laughs> when I can. Yeah. Um, and just to, you know, with your projects in the future. And of course, we'll share um, the link to your website and um, some links so that people can go and, and find you and see what you're up to. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today, uh, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Great to have you. 
good talking to you guys. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and found it both informative and insightful. We welcome all your questions and your feedback about today's episode. And especially, we welcome your questions about specific topics that you would like us to cover. So shoot us an email at podcast at alpha i.com. And if you have a moment, we really appreciate ratings and reviews as it helps us grow our online community and our interactions with you. And we'll also be linking to a number of relevant articles on topics that we might have touched on during our conversations. Some of them are broad, some of them are technical, but we're always aiming to provide information that helps you better understand the mechanics of building this healthy financial foundation, especially if you're looking to do this with real estate.